Thanks, thanks, Don. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, so this work, uh, uh, like Don said, was done at Rutgers uh, uh, when I was a postdoc with David Vanderbilt, and then very closely with our previous speaker, Max Stengel, and uh, student Andrea Schifino from Barcelona, and I'm now at Stony Brook in the, the Flatiron Institute. So uh, Max has done a lot of the work for me regarding the motivation for why we were uh, working in this area. Uh, what we wanted to calculate uh, are these flexoelectric coefficients, uh, as Max already introduced. And uh, the, the important thing in this case is that we have these variety of strain gradients uh, and variety of responses, some of which are longitudinal, others, like depicted here, are transverse. Again, the polarization is in a different direction than the gradient. And so our goal was basically to develop uh, an efficient DFT implementation to calculate these flexoelectric coefficients. And uh, I highlight the word efficient um, because uh, uh, the formalism and some implementations had been done to calculate uh, the flexoelectric response in the past, both in David's group uh, and by Max. And uh, I won't go into the details of these implementations, uh, but they shared a, a very important limitation, which was uh, their kind of inherent efficiency. And their efficiency was limited because they had to uh, rely on uh, supercells or slab cells in order to calculate uh, even the bulk flexoelectric response. And so I'll say why that is in a second, but what we would like to do is to calculate flexoelectric response, uh, uh, as Max already introduced, in the same way as we would calculate phonon dispersions or any other response properties uh, from uh, linear response calculations on, on single unit cells. And so uh, uh, that's kind of what we, we had set out to do. The reason that these previous calculations uh, required these tricks with supercell or slab cells is the following. So if you think about uh, the response to a gradient, uh, one, way to, one immediate way to think about it is to look at how the charge density in the crystal changes and of course, the first order charge density is something that is implemented in most uh, DFT packages and very accessible within Abinet. Um, however, the, uh, the charge density in, in bulk only contains information about the longitudinal component of the polarization field. And therefore, uh, we, if we do a bulk calculation and we calculate the first order charge, uh, we only have access to the longitudinal flexoelectric coefficients. And then to get the, the other ones, these transverse or shear coefficients, uh, we had to rely on, 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 before these previous implementations, had to rely on some, some tricks. So uh, if we want the full polarization response, uh, one place where we can look uh, uh, is in the current density that's induced by uh, the atomic deformations. And so, of course, the current density uh, contains all the information about the polarization. Um, but, we, but it's related classically to this time derivative of the polarization. So if we'd like to get at the polarization response from the current density, then we need to treat our atomic deformations to create this uh, gradient as, uh, as, as time dependent. Uh, adiabatic, but, but time dependent. And so uh, if we, 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 that's the reason why we're interested in calculating the, the current density. Uh, there have been a variety of implementations to calculate uh, the current density in various forms in the past, uh, including by people in this room. I just list a very small subset uh, here, uh, uh, including magnetic and dielectric susceptibility, and also things like NMR chemical shifts and components of the, the, the G tensor. However, uh, in, in these cases, what has most often been treated are uh, uniform perturbations and as Max introduced, when we have a strain gradient, uh, we have a, a non-uniform uh, perturbation. And so it turns out that this causes some, some subtleties uh, with respect to, to calculating uh, and defining the current density. So again, as Max introduced, um, we, uh, we can uh, uh, switch to our discussion to reciprocal space, where we identify these strain gradients in acoustic phonons. 
And therefore, the problem of this non-uniform perturbation is a problem of a finite Q response. And, uh, and we're interested, again, in the response to second order in Q, which is the flexoelectric coefficient. So the, the, the goal is to calculate the current density in order to get at the polarization response um, at, at a finite Q. And then if we take the second derivative of that, we can uh, access the flexoelectricity, like uh, as Max mentioned. So uh, the, the, in this implementation, what we first need to do is treat our perturbation as, uh, as time dependent, adiabatic, but time dependent. And then we need to define a, a current operator that, that when will, uh, will give us the, the, the correct current for a finite Q displacement or finite Q perturbation. And so uh, just quickly, uh, I'll, I'll introduce uh, how, how we do this. So the, uh, uh, because, we're in, because the polarization is related to the adiabatic current, so a current from a slow motion of the atoms, then uh, what we can do is just do a low order expansion of the, the full time dependent response um, of, uh, in this case, lambda, where lambda is parameterizing this atomic motion to create the gradient. At uh, zeroth order, we have the static eigenfunctions that we can calculate. And then we just need to go up to first order uh, in the velocity of the atomic motion, uh, lambda dot. And these uh, so-called first order adiabatic wave functions uh, are, are things that can be calculated uh, straightforwardly using all the tools of density functional perturbation theory. Uh, they just uh, require uh, being able to calculate, again, the response uh, of a, a static phonon mode and, uh, and solving one additional uh, Sternheimer equation uh, to get the, the adiabatic contribution. So uh, those are things that we can calculate, the static and the adiabatic uh, 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 wave functions. And then we need to define a current operator uh, at, at some finite Q that will give us the electronic response of the, of the, uh, to this uh, gradient or, or long wavelength phonon. And so um, this, this at first might seem like not that much of a challenge. Of course, we know uh, that the, the current density is a well-defined quantum mechanical observable, and we've gone through this procedure in, in our textbooks where we combine the continuity condition uh, with the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, and we end up with an operator that is the, the momentum uh, operator, uh, and, and, and we have a, a density operator. So uh, as we also know, uh, this procedure makes some assumptions about the form of the Hamiltonian uh, specifically that it has only local potentials that commute with the density operator. And of course, when we have uh, pseudo potentials, uh, we have these non-local operators that, um, that uh, occur in our, our Hamiltonian. And so uh, that previous, previous, uh, the previous uh, uh, operator needs to be modified slightly. Uh, the reason being that, of course, if we have non-local operators, then we can have within the cutoff radius of our pseudopotential, these kind of discontinuous motions of charge. And those uh, cause problems for the continuity equation. And uh, this, this kind of textbook version of the current density uh, actually violates the continuity equation uh, when these non-local operators are present. So probably what, um, uh, again, what is familiar to many of you is that uh, uh, the, the way that you usually fix this is by expressing in terms of the more general velocity operator, which is the commutator between the position operator and the Hamiltonian. However, uh, this is also uh, incomplete in our case. It gives the correct uh, macroscopic current. But again, since our perturbation is, is, uh, is non-uniform or, or finite Q, uh, then uh, we, we need the continuity condition, for example, to be satisfied locally. And, uh, and it turns out that this form of the current density, or this form of the, yeah, the current density using the velocity operator gives the correct macroscopic current, but not, not the correct microscopic current. And so um, we need an alternative definition of the current uh, uh, operator. And uh, I think there's a variety of ways to, to think about this. The way that, that, that I think about it is 
that if we look at, uh, uh, we go back to classical electrodynamics, we, can, uh, we know that the energy that's stored in a magnetic field, for example, uh, can be written in the following form. And there you kind of see that the, the current density multiplied by a vector potential is, uh, is somewhat of an energy density. And so, again, you can write the, the current density uh, or define the current density as the derivative of the energy with respect to a vector potential, uh, which we then turn into a, a current density operator. Um, uh, that's our derivative, our Hamiltonian, that's coupled to a vector potential. So the idea is that we, we use a vector potential to kind of probe the electronic response of the system to our, uh, our perturbation, in this case, a, 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 a gradient or long wavelength phonon perturbation. So there, there's one more uh, subtlety, or there's a couple more subtleties, but one of them is that we want to couple this vector potential to uh, a Hamiltonian, which, as I just said, contains these non-local operators. And so again, in several contexts, this has been, uh, this has been treated. And basically, uh, the, so the, the cartoon picture of the problem is, again, uh, we have these non-local operators that could, in principle, cause these kind of discontinuous motions of charge density when we apply them to our wave functions. And of course, as we move through a vector potential, we need to accumulate a phase to get the correct magnetic translational symmetry. And we can uh, ensure that this phase is correctly accounted for by multiplying our non-local Hamiltonian by, uh, by a complex, th this, this form of a complex phase uh, where we have a, a line integral over the, the vector potential. And so uh, if, if all of our uh, perturbation, if, all, if our Hamiltonian is local, then this would reduce exactly to just the minimal substitution, but uh, this takes into account uh, the effect of those non-local parts. So um, uh, I think I'll skip this. Uh, so the, the, in, as I said before, our strategy is we are probing the electronic response uh, with this vector potential. So our vector potential we choose with uh, uh, modulated by the same phase as, as the response we like to calculate. We couple it to the Hamiltonian, and then if we take the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to the vector potential, we get the current. Uh, when you kind of combine these uh, together, uh, what you get is uh, this somewhat complicated form of the, the current density. Uh, it has these uh, exponential factors from our form of the vector potential. Uh, we also have here the non-local Hamiltonian, et cetera. So I, I won't go into any, any details. Uh, everything is in, these paper, in this paper. Um, but what we can show is that, first of all, that form of the current density satisfies the continuity equation. It also reduces to the textbook expression of the, of the current that includes the, the momentum matrix elements outside of the cutoff sphere where our potential is local. And finally, it reproduces this known form of the macroscopic current, which has to do with the velocity operator. And uh, I'll just kind of flash one quick uh, uh, equation about how uh, it was implemented. So basically, all that it requires is, uh, is uh, so, so the way that we implemented it, we needed uh, the current to be correct up to second order in Q. So we, did, we expanded that form of the current density up to second order. And uh, that resulted in these derivatives of the, the non-local uh, potential with respect to, to K, so these energy uh, or electric field uh, uh, responses. Uh, and then, so first order, second order in K uh, uh, is, are used for other things. And then we, we had to go to third order uh, in K, third order derivative in K. So um, just in the, the last minute, I just want to point out one, one additional uh, uh, complication which Max alluded to which is in the fact that um, that comes up when you look at shear or transverse gradients, that not only do you have, uh, if you look at a unit cell under these gradients, you have some shear that is placed on this unit cell, but you also have a rotation of this unit cell. And this rotation actually adds an additional contribution to the flexoelectric coefficient because it creates a, a current by, because of the rotation. Um, this current is, is related to the diamagnetic uh, susceptibility of the crystal. Um, so we actually, in our implementation, we have to 
to uh, do an additional calculation of the diamagnetic susceptibility. Um, but this problem and the, the previous equation for our implementation can be simplified greatly with this metric implementation that, uh, that, that Max introduced. So if we deform our coordinate system along with our atoms, then we no longer need to, uh, we no longer have these rigid rotations. Uh, and also, as Max mentioned, we only need to take the second derivative of the non-local potential with respect to K. So uh, I'm, I'm out of time. I'll just say that we implemented this in the Abinet code and we, we tested it for a variety of cases. This is just simple case for strontium titanate where we can calculate the polarization with respect to phonon uh, wave vector. Uh, these curves are quadratic as they should be. And if we take the second derivative of these curves, we can obtain the flexoelectric coefficients, which agree very well with, with previous calculations. So um, I, I'm out of time, so I'll just leave up my summary and thank you for your attention. <laughs>